Good evening and a warm welcome to KTN Prime. Tonight, the Division of Revenue Bill 2013 is low after President Uhuru Kenyatta assented to the bill. Is devolution under threat? Well, assenting to the bill will further push the two legislative houses farther apart. The Senate now threatening to take the supremacy battle to the corridors of justice. Also tonight, Parliament was occupied by activists, but it was all in vain as elsewhere a deal was struck between the Parliamentary Service Commission and the Salaries and Remuneration Commission. This is KTN Prime. Thank you for joining us. I'm Linda Ogutu. Welcome to the program. I'm Eric Njoka. These are the top stories tonight. The law is very, very clear. This house debated it. There are no two ways about it. See you in court. Senators furious at Uhuru for assenting to the Division of Revenue Bill. Pigs protests in Parliament amid reports of a salary deal. Who was behind the attacks? Find out in the Killer Gangs of Western Kenya, Part 2. And on how things work tonight, we tell you more about the magic of colors. ATN Prime begins now. The supremacy battle between the Senate and the National Assembly is now headed to the Supreme Court. President Uhuru Kenyatta is a center to the Division of Revenue Bill sparking protests from the Senate. The Senate is accusing the President of colluding with the National Assembly to undermine devolution. Our senior reporter Aaron Ocheng begins our bulletin this evening with a bill that, is, that has now drawn all the three arms of governments into battle. apologize for the sound problem in that story. Let's take it again. And the supremacy battle between the Senate and the National Assembly is now headed to the Supreme Court. President Uhuru Kenyatta has assented to the Division of Revenue Bill sparking protests from the Senate. Now the Senate is accusing the President of colluding with the National Assembly to undermine devolution. Aaron Ocheng has details of this story. Take a look. President Uhuru Kenyatta has ignited fire at the Senate by choosing to overlook its recommendations to the Division of Revenue Bill and going ahead to sign the controversial bill into law, thereby favoring the National Assembly. Effectively, President Kenyatta's move means the counties will now receive less funds than what the senators and governors had wanted as the start of the county autonomy officially begins on July 1st. Parliament was this afternoon informed that the president had assented to the controversial bill. I am not fighting money that is going to counties. In fact, I would even want it to 300, to be 300 billion or 400 billion if there is a scientific way of arriving at it. And I'm sure the president has assented to that, but I want to make the confirmation to the House. Because the law is very, very clear. I can confirm to the House that the Division of Revenue Bill was ascended to yesterday at 9.30 a.m. The Senate adjourned and went into a closed session to discuss the President's move, obviously feeling beaten by the National Assembly. Article 95 of the Constitution will give the National Assembly powers to determine the allocation of national revenue between the levels of government. Article 96 of the role of the Senate gives the Senate powers to determine allocation of national revenue among counties, and this is where the Senate feels its role has been defied. Legal experts supporting the president say the National Assembly determines how much money will go to the county governments, while the Senate merely determines how the money approved by the National Assembly shall be shared among the 47 counties. Senate had wanted 258 billion shillings allocated to the counties, 48 billion more than what the National Assembly passed. 
the senators say they will move to court Wednesday morning to seek to nullify the president's move as well as to seek the Supreme Court's advisory opinion on the president's assent to the bill. Under the law, any state organ or agency, and this includes the Senate, can request for an advisory opinion of uh, the Supreme Court on a matter that affects the discharge of his activities. The Senate we are going to court because as a house we have decided to follow the constitution strictly and to exercise our mandate strictly within the constitution. We want to res uh, uh, resolve this matter through an extra constitutional process. We will be acting within the four walls of the constitution. President Kenyatta was under pressure to reject the controversial bill with less than 20 days left to the beginning of the next financial year. The president's move now leaves the National Assembly with a choice of introducing a supplementary budget proposal in the name of CDF, which will be channeled directly to their respective constituency accounts, which senators and governors will have no control over. Aaron Ocheng, KTN. Now, President Uhuru Kenyatta has defended his decision to sign into law the controversial Division of Revenue Bill. The president says he acted within the law in assenting to the bill and that he was pursuing national interest with a view to safeguarding the integrity and timeless, uh, timeliness of the budgetary process. Uhuru says in the aftermath of the stalemate between the National Assembly and the Senate, the options of the executive under the law are limited to not acting at all, vetoing the bill or assenting to the bill. The president says the most prudent cause of action was to assent to the bill in order to facilitate the timely conclusion of budgetary process and avert the risk of bringing government business to a halt. He said by not signing the bill, he would have severely compromised the ability of county governments to take off in the very first year. Uhuru says by assenting to the bill, he is not undermining the devolution process as claimed by his critics saying the new law was supported by the entire National Assembly. Right, in just a few minutes, we will be speaking to Homer Bay Senator Otieno Kajuang to understand what the bone of contention really is between the National Assembly and the Senate. The Senate is not very amused. They have made up their minds. They say tomorrow they will head to the courts to get the interpretation of the courts on the Constitution and really what this means. And, of course, that story leads us to a big question tonight. And we are asking you, do you support Uhuru's decision to ascend to the controversial bill? Send a yes or no response with a brief comment to the number eight zero four zero and we will sample your views at the end of this live newscast you are watching ktn prime our big question tonight do you support president uhuru kenyatta's decision to ascend to the controversial bill we are looking at this question it has been it has pitted the national assembly and the senate and in just a few minutes actually right now let's bring in homer bay senator otino kajuang to help us to understand what the bone of contention is uh, with the division of revenue bill he's joining us from our city center studio senator thank you very much for joining us on ktn prime what is your problem as the senate with the bill that uh, the president has signed into law? Well, we feel that the president, by enacting uh, this law or this bill, has undermined the authority of the Senate to the extent to which uh, the Senate role is to protect the interests of the counties. We feel that um, in the division of revenue, uh, the Senate has a central role to make sure that they begin with the national government and make sure that the counties get what they should get. What happened, as it is now, is that um, the National Assembly decided that that is their role, reached a figure of 210 billion, which if divided to the counties with the formula that we have seen, over 80, 18 counties will have serious deficit, including Nairobi, which will have a deficit of 7 billion on the role that you have been given. Mombasa will have a deficit of 2 billion Kenya shillings. Nakuru will have a deficit of 2 billion. Eldoret and Kisumu the same. 
So essentially what we are saying is that when dividing the revenue, the Senate is the body that protects the interest because there is no other interest of, uh, of the county government other than to get sufficient revenue to run the affairs. And I think this is a conspiracy between Parliament and the Executive. Senator, so, you say you think this is a conspiracy between Parliament and the Executive. In just a few, a few minutes ago, there has been a new dimension to this, Senator. The President has issued a statement. In it, he says, in assenting to the bill, he was pursuing national interest with a view to safeguarding the integrity and timelines of the budgetary process. Does he make sense to you? No, it does not. Because um, the Senate dealt with this thing almost two weeks ago, more than 14 days ago. And they knew immediately Parliament disagreed with us. There is a provision in which uh, two speakers could have appointed equal numbers uh, of their membership to negotiate this contentious issue. And I think two days or one day is enough for them to have arrived at a certain figure because in the event that the mediation fails, then the bill fails. And nobody would want to see that bill fail because then the nation, the nation will not be funded. So uh, he delayed until uh, almost uh, when, when he had to now sign uh, because there was no more time left. So it, we cannot blame it on the Senate. We, we blame it squarely on the two institutions of the National Assembly and the Executive. Senator, let me put you a little bit on the spot. Um, in the sense of this bill, the President may have taken Chapter 8 of the new Constitution into consideration. Article 95, subsection 4, says the National Assembly determines the allocation of national revenue between the levels of government, that is the central government and the county government. Article 96, subsection 3, says the Senate determines the allocation of national revenue among counties and exercises oversight over national revenue allocated to county government. When you look really at this constitution, Senator, correct me if I'm wrong, the president could be right. Well, the interpretation can go either way, and there will be a lot of debate on that. But what it says in Article 218 is that at least two months before the end of the financial year, there shall be introduced in parliament the division of revenue bill. And parliament there means the two houses. And so, in fact, that is how it happened. It first went to the National Assembly. The National Assembly determined that this is a matter which affects the county governments. And so, immediately you realize that a matter affects the county governments, then you must bring it to the Senate. And they did so with a memorandum from the Speaker. And when it came to us, we dealt with it as a matter of rights and uh, submitted back to the National Assembly an amendment, which they, it seems they, re, uh, they rejected. Immediately after that, we should have gone to mediation. But to proceed and sign it into law is to ignore the Senate, which means, and this is what it means, that when it comes to determining how much the, the county should get, the Senate, which is supposed to protect the counties, is not invited. When it comes to now allocating what has been given, then the, uh, the Senate can now divide it between the counties. That is serious anomaly. It is like saying, uh, we will kill the animal. We will, first of all, divide it ourselves, what you get. And then you can do whatever you like with your peace. That is not protecting the interests of the counties. A very interesting interpretation, Senator, I must say. So this was not referred to a mediation committee. It was not taken back to the originate, uh, originating house for reconsideration. Does this then worry you about the relevance of the Senate when it comes to devolution and when it comes to revenue allocation? Of course, uh, it worries us. And that is why we are going for interpretation in the Supreme Court. And that is why the Senate has uh, elected me as the new chairman to chair a committee that will deal with amendments to the Constitution that will put the Senate where it must be. 
that the Senate must be consulted on all revenue matters before it can be signed into law. We will make those amendments and we will go to the people to determine whether they should be part of the law or not. To make it clear that the Senate's job to protect the interests of the country includes debating with the national government on how we share the revenue. All right, Homa Bay, Senator Otino Kajuang, talking to us about the Division of Revenue Bill that has now pitted the National Assembly and the Senate. Senator, thank you so much for joining us on KTN Prime. Of course, this is an issue that will raise a lot of arguments tomorrow. The Senate now says they are going to court. This has a long way. It we is. still have a it long has. way to go with this. It has. And you know, uh, this is, we are talking about devolution here. And you know, devolution is a new system in, in Kenya. So for the president to assent this, it's actually going to have mixed reactions all over. Let's so see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. And remember the question of the day is, do you support Uhuru's uh, assentment to that bill? Send your yes or no comments uh, to the number 8040. You can also tweet us at Katie and Kenya, at Linda Ogutu, and at Eric Njoka, respectively. Let's move on now. And activities outside parliament buildings were brought to a standstill as the civil society staged yet another protest this afternoon against members of parliament push for higher pay. But even as the protest heated up, KTN has learned that the SRSRM elite team and the Parliamentary Service Commission have finally come to an agreement on how much the members of parliament will earn. KTN's Asham Wilu with the details. <laughs> True to their word, they hit the streets. Activists protesting MPs' push for a pay rise held their second demonstration in Nairobi. The protest, dubbed Occupy Parliament Reloaded, caused a stir in the CBD as protesters chanted slogans and carried placards with messages directed at legislators. The Harambe Avenue entrance to Parliament was a no-go zone, forcing MPs to use alternative routes to attend the afternoon proceedings. Anti-riot police, however, monitored from a distance. But just when the protests seemed to be slowing down... <laughs> the activists became rowdy, throwing bags filled with animal blood on the road, all over Parliament's entrance, and occasionally pelting police officers with the blood bags. Inchi yetu hii ni inchi ambayo inarudi nyuma sasa kimaendeleo kivyovyote kwa sababu ya greediness ya wajumbe hawa. But all this could have been wasted energy. According to reports reaching KTN, the Salaries and Remuneration Commission has sealed a deal with the Parliamentary Service Commission on legislators pay. President Uhuru Kenyatta is said to have directed his deputy, William Ruto, to help resolve the stalemate that has derailed legislative agenda of the 11th Parliament. In turn, a meeting was held at the DP's official residence in Karen, where it was resolved that MPs would stick to the 532,000 shillings taxable pay per month. The 5 million shilling car grant proposed earlier was agreed on, as well as a pension contribution fund. In addition, all MPs would get untaxed mileage allowance in tandem with the AA rates. The meeting, which lasted close to seven hours last evening, was attended by Speaker Justin Muturi, MPs Edan Kainan and Gladys Wanga, as well as Senators David Musila, Beth Mugo, and Sami Leshore. Sarah Serem led the team of SRC commissioners. The irony of these protests against MPs' pay is that they come on the week when Parliament is supposed to be read for the budget and when Kenyans will get the whole picture of the wage bill and just how much the country can afford to pay the members of Parliament. Asha Mwilu, KTN, Nairobi. Uh, the Makueni Senate race took a dramatic twist today after counsel Kepi Kilonzo stepped down in favor of her stepmother Nduku Kilonzo. Now, the announcement was relayed via a tweet from Kathy in which she said that she will not face off with her mother for fear of a curse. But as Sam Ogina reports, Kathy's decision is not going down well with the Makueni electorate. <laughs> The entry of Nduku Kilonzo into the Makueni Senate seat has turned disquiet in the Kilonzo family. Mutula Kilonzo's daughter, Kathy Kilonzo, who had yielded to Cold's pressure to fly its flag bow out Tuesday morning in a tweet on her official Twitter handle, citing a reservation to contest against her mother. Quoting her tweet, Kathy says, A child does not compete with the mother. 
It is a curse, this to avoid an apparent split in clashing with her stepmother. Flanked by Land's Cabinet Secretary Charity Ngilu, Nduko Kilonzo plunged herself in the Mutula succession race Sunday after a church service in Machakos attended by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Are you running for, for the service? Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> What party? Are you running against her? No, I am not. She is not running. You are the one who is running yes. at the moment, yes. The Nduku Ngilu link has sent signals that she might be preferred to succeed the late Mutula Kilonzo within the Jubilee ranks. Jubilee Alliance is keen to fill the single candidate to square it out with the Wiper Party that had sponsored the late Mutula Kilonzo to the Senate. What party are you running? <laughs> she will call you. No, I will let you know at the moment because this is a, a different uh, forum. And when time comes, then I will announce. Kathy regretted her decision to drop out of the race, saying, quote, Today is a dark day. May the people of Makueni and all who stood with me one day find it in their hearts to forgive me. End of quote. Sources in the Wiper Party say they prevailed upon Kathy to step down in favor of her mother to avoid a family split. Nonetheless, Wiper is yet to identify its candidate for the July 22nd by-election. Meanwhile, Nduku's candidacy is already exciting the public. A step aside, now to party Kathy. By Friday last week, Cord had managed to convince Kathy Kilonzo to contest the Makueni Senate seat to succeed her late father. Nduku Kilonzo may face off with former Kilome MP John Haron Mwau, who was second in the March 4th election. Samogina Ketian, Nairobi. Now, a day after President Uhuru Kenyatta directed that foreigners involved in drug trafficking should be deported, experts are warning that an even bigger challenge awaits those tasked with the responsibility, that of accessible, affordable, and efficient rehabilitation centers. The lack of such facilities has led to a vicious cycle for drug users who are unable to keep away from drugs. And Joe Katusia reports on the war on drugs that will require more than just a directive to win. <laughs> These images have become synonymous with stories of drug addictions whenever they are told. At times we pass judgment on the drug users, but many have been enslaved in addiction whose cost of freeing themselves is beyond their reach. The fight against drug abuse cannot be fought by dealing with the traffickers only, but those addicted will need to undergo rehabilitation. When we arrive at Pwani Retreat, a drug and alcohol abuse rehabilitation center, clients are going through their daily routine. Majority are here to recover from their drug abuse habits. But what exactly do they go through to ensure an efficient process? But here in the retreat, what we do is we assess the individual. We take the history as we normally do. And this is, this is being done by both the nurses as well as the doctor. Then the doctor prescribes the medication. After he has prescribed the medication, the patient um, is seen on, on a day-to-day day basis. I take the patient through psychoeducation. Uh, here I skill patients with uh, various ways of uh, life skills. So we have to do a very, very rigid program of follow-up. And this patient is given maybe the first two weeks or the first one week, and then later on he's given the first month. This is just a brief outline of what a drug or alcohol addict goes through to recover. But unfortunately, the cost of rehabilitation is so high that many cannot afford to pay for it. For instance, here at Pwani Retreat, one will have to part with 10,000 shillings per day. Unfortunately, you know, when a patient comes here, they have to pay because this is how we sustain ourselves. But how many can afford this? Unfortunately, majority of rehabilitation centers supported by the government have closed down due to lack of support from the government. While human resource is limited with regions like the coast region, which is notorious for drug abuse, having only one government psychiatrist. 
And so even as the government intensifies the war on drug trafficking, it must be remembered that more needs to be done regarding rehabilitation. Angel Katuse, KTN. You're watching KTN Prime. Thank you so much for staying with us. Let's take a look at our big question tonight. And we asked you if you support Uhuru's decision to ascend to the controversial bill. And let's take a look at some of your responses. Mukwe says, Uhuru is super smart. He doesn't want to give all resources to counties, which is fine. More devolution. Well, Jay Katusia, you say uh, on Twitter that, uh, yes, I support his focus was on the budgeting process and the strict timelines time time involved. Well, you can send your more comments to the number 8040 as well as on our Twitter page. That's at Katie and Kenya. And we'll read them at, a, at the tail end of this live no newscast. I think um, I need to get water <laughs> You're now. having tongue issues, yeah. of course. Later <laughs> on in the bulletin, <laughs> we will be looking at the killer gangs of Western Kenya. Patrick Amimo will be trying to find out who has been killing the residents and why. For now, we take a short break. Here's what's coming up. Six trillion shilling budget for Kenya, and we ask, can Kenya afford this budget? Also on tonight's bulletin, after Kenya Revenue Authority failing to meet its target, is the tax body doing its job right? Have these questions this edition of KTN Business Today. Join me, Joy Doreen Vera. Thank you very much for staying with Katie and welcome back to the program. Let's move on now to the killer gangs of Western Kenya. And even as police downplayed their attacks, dismissing them as no more crime, our investigations show there was a political hand in their attacks. In the second part of our series, The Killer Gangs of Western Kenya, Patrick Amimo spoke to three people who are recruited by a prominent politician in Western Kenya after the elections to be part of the killer gangs with promises of financial rewards. When the sun sets in western Kenya, residents of Bungoma and Busia counties begin to ponder over their safety. For over a month, they have been under the threat and masses of criminal killer gangs. In the course of our investigations, we managed to squeeze interviews from three people who said they had been recruited by a politician for an analyst close assignment. They said they defected after realizing they were being prepared for killer missions. Armed with this information, we traveled by road up to Port Victoria. It is a sleepy town along the shores of Lake Victoria in Busia County, and fishing is the dominant activity. We were welcomed by pulsating music from one of the local artists that almost excited us to shake a leg. But then, our visit here followed cries of anguish and desperation in Busia and Bungoma counties with the pointers that some islands in the lake could have been used as hideouts and training camps for some of the recruits of the killer gangs. We boarded an engine boat to get to some of the islands that were identified to us as training camps. Hanete Island measures about 200 acres and has a dense forest. We moved closer to get a sneak preview of human activities on the island. We also surveyed a second island called Nabaduma. Here, we encountered a group of people whom we assumed were fishermen. But when we moved closer, some of them became hostile and questioned why we were filming them. And before long, our engine stalled. For almost 10 minutes, our boat swayed under the mercy of waves. Though I and my colleague Robert Wanyonji don't know how to swim, our guides on this tour were very calm. That gave us confidence. The youths who were captured in the boat were equally professional. Soon, we discovered the hostile fishermen had attempted to trap and detain our boat using a rope. Soon the engine roared back to life and we proceeded with the voyage. 
Hanete and Abaduma Islands are strategic and could provide good cover for anybody with ill intentions. Footpaths on the island show repeated human activities could be taking place here. This is what the will-be recruits of the killer gangs told us about their brief stay on these islands. The defectors tell us recruits underwent some rituals and offering. Those who took the oath were promised financial rewards. Apart from lake piracy, residents of Sumba Island told us that gangsters from neighboring Uganda often attack them. Wanaingia mpaka Kenya wanatembea ndani. Sasa ni kitu wamejua hapa hakuna security. Managers of the beach confirmed presence of suspicious elements, camouflage as fishermen who operate on islands in the lake that are assumed to be uninhabited. Wanajificha kama wavuvi. Eh ndio nimesema sasa ili kuwatambua zaidi inabidi tufanye patrol za pamoja. Uh, fisheries na marine police na BM. Na sasa sisi tumetoa ilani ya kwamba watu wasipatikane huko. Residents of Port Victoria accused the marine police of failing to conduct frequent patrols in the lake. Indeed, the speedboat has been angered in the lake and manned for months on end now. And this was a response from a senior officer at Port Victoria Police Station. The officer referred us to his boss in Busia town for a brief on insecurity in the lake and existence of training camps for thugs. I might be knowing a lot, but I cannot divulge that information to you. For two days running, the OCPD Busia declined to grant us an interview. Some suspects have, however, been arrested and made confessions. Kuna wale ya alitaja, njiu fiungusi ya hapa. Pia alituelesa ukule malaba kuna maali wameweka hizo vifa, asa kabisa kama nipanga. Alafu na mapikipiki yale wanatumia usiku. Kundi yao, walikuwa nasema ni... Mungano ya kutu maakama. Ya alisema, hao kasi yao ni kuuwa tu. Bila hata kujali, pengine kamu uko na pesa uwachwe. Kamu utakuwa na pesa, utatoa tu kwa jili ya uchungu zaku. In Bungoma County, one of the victims discloses to us that the attackers who are known to them collaborated with accomplices from Uganda. The group made rituals before launching attack. Wakakuja tu watu wengi, wakakuwa tu wengi na walikuwa wanaoficha tu kwa nyumba. Hawa kukua wakitendea inje ama wanaonekana inje. Walikuwa tu wakikaa kwa nyumba kutoka asibui mbaka chioni. Hawa kukua wakitendea. Iyo siku vile ilifika yenye walikata kata watu. Waka chinja kuku. 
wakapasua kuku alafu waka shona tena na nyuzi wakaiwacha ikatembea tu ikaamka ikaenda ikapotea alafu wakafuata tena wakachinja kondo wakakula hiyo kondo vile walimaliza kondo ndio wakaanza tena kukatakata watu that is a glimpse of how the killer gangs have spread terror in western kenya in our third segment we focus on how insecurity has affected business and economic activities in this region. I am Pati Kamimo, reporting for KTN. Very well, thank you very much for staying with KTN. Let's remind you the big question tonight. We had asked you, do you support Uhuru's decision to assent to the controversial bill? And we told you to send your comments to the number 8040 or to our Twitter handle at KTN Kenya. Uh, Tinega Moore says, you say on Twitter, why not? The Senate is playing second fiddle to the August House. It's like playing gimmicks to see who's powerful. Dominic says, I believe my president Uhuru has done the right thing. The evolution is young. We cannot satisfy everybody now. Those are your opinions. Thank you so much for staying with KTN Prime. We're taking a short break. Business News is up next. Coming up on KTN Sports today, we have athletic scandal at the Nyan Nishim Stadium. And of course, big test for a stars tomorrow against Malawi. And more on gossip transfer news. Only on KTN Sports today. Coming up. The constitution is very, very clear. All the organs of state are bound by the constitution to follow the constitution and by all the organs of states we mean parliament which includes the national assembly and the senate it also includes presidency it also includes the courts themselves so every organ of state must follow the constitution in in arriving at the decisions Thank you for keeping it, KTN. It's time for us to look at business. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. With a 1.6 trillion shillings budget and a thinning revenue source, questions are emerging over Kenya's ability to comfortably meet its budget obligation. Michael Karanja asks the question, is Kenya a wonderland in our continued budget agenda coverage? Budget 2013-2014 in association with ICEA Lion Group. Every year in June, Kenyans of all walks of life look forward to the tabling of budget as it gives an indication of which direction government is taking to improve their living standards as well as stimulate economic growth. Kenya's main revenue drivers are tax collection by the Kenya Revenue Authority, the agricultural, manufacturing and tourism sectors, as well as grants and loans from international lenders. According to the just released economic survey, the agricultural sector grew by 3.8% with a marketed production of 344.6 billion shillings to the economy. The manufacturing sector saw some deceleration from 3.4% to 3.1%, largely due to high production costs, stiff competition from imported goods, and the high cost of credit. Elections, security issues, and the crisis in the Eurozone saw the tourism sector take a major hit. International arrivals dipped by 6.1% to 1.7 million tourists, which led to the tourism earnings, which is a major source of foreign exchange, decreased to 96 billion shillings. The taxman is also stretched, only managing to raise 566 billion shillings out of the 800 billion shillings target set out by the Treasury to finance the current budget. Already, there are signs that the National Treasury might be biting off more than it can chew by bumping the next budget even further. Although struggling to meet its current target, KRA is expected to collect 880 billion shillings while estimates of revenue, grants and loans show that non-tax revenue is expected to fall by 1.4% to 38.9 billion shillings. Appropriation in aid, the money collected by ministries and state departments, is also expected to fall to 67.3 billion shillings. In total, the government plans to collect 986 billion shillings, the highest ever planned to be collected in a single financial year. Let's now try and put things into perspective. On one hand, you have a government with a budget of 1.6 trillion shillings, and on the other hand, a debt of 1 trillion shillings. Add all this together and it becomes very apparent that the Jubilee government is going to have a hard task meeting the promises it made to Kenyans during its campaign period. This then begs the question of whether Kenya is Wonderland, where all things can be achieved when it's clear that our expenses clearly outstrip our income. As in the domestic debt means that Kenya must spend more to service the loans, ultimately increasing the government's recurrent expenditure and crowding out development budget. Three options are available to the Jubilee Coalition success in running a government that will deliver on its promises 
to the electorate while maintaining a fiscal balance that is required for long-term growth. Treasury could calibrate the growth of the debt if it wins a large amount of donor support for some of the economic programs. Mandarin's other treasury could also increase the taxes to get the money it needs to invest in the economy to secure long-term growth or simply renege on some of the budget-busting promises made during the campaigns. Michael Karanja, KTN Business Today. Thanks, Michael, for that report. Now charged with the cardinal role of collecting taxes on behalf of the Kenyan government is the Kenya Revenue Authority. And we're asking, is it doing a good job? Tax experts are thinking otherwise. And Adelaide Chingole reports, uh, as she reports, it may actually be that KRA might need to change tact. And here's why. Budget 2013-2014 in association with ICEA Lion Group. The Kenya Revenue Authority has long been reviled for being an overbearing, pompous and aloof body that isn't sensitive to the needs of the populace. This opinion has shaped the attitudes Kenyan have for Kerry, which is that the body is a tyrant organization. Over time, uh, the KRA has refused, either by design or uh, by default to change with times. Reason why Kenya cannot do it to date uh, perhaps uh, is a deliberate attempt to cover up for corruption. One aspect that is being cited is a tax dispute resolution mechanisms which include the local committee, the VAT tribunal, the customs tribunal or excise tribunal. PKF says these bodies have lost public confidence since they are populated by people without a clear grasp of tax laws. Moreover, if a tax player loses an appeal at the tribunals, they must pay the full amount of taxes in dispute to carry before they can file appeal at the high court, something they say denies the taxpayer their rights to justice. A client is assessed 600 million shillings, which is fictitious sometimes, which is out of misinterpretation of the law. And for him to get justice, he is required to pay the taxes upfront. The analysts want the taxman to enter the 21st century by embracing the use of technology to scale up interaction with taxpayers and also to increase its efficiency in collecting taxes. But perhaps the reason for this underperformance has been the perennial underfunding of KRA. Last year, Treasury paid KRA 10.1 billion shillings, accounting for 1.5% of the national revenue. But this was much lower than the expenditure of 12 billion shillings. The decision to increase the commissions 2% could therefore spur the needed reforms in the authority. It's time for a new way of thinking at KRA if they want to make a break from the past. These new technologies could change the fortunes of the taxman, increase compliance and win KRA some much needed public support. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business Today. Budget 2013-2014 in association with ICEA Lion Group. Of course, let's not forget that KRA failed to meet its targets as of the financial year that was last year. And well, it's time for us to look at the financial markets report and also see how the listed companies are performing at the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Not to forget as well that how things work will be coming up immediately after the financial report. My name is Joy Dorin Bira. Good evening. Thank you very much for staying with us. Welcome back. It's now that time on a Tuesday night when we learn how our favorite products are made on how things work. Tonight, Betty Charlo delves deeper into the world of color. Want to know more? Let's take a look. Homes, real estate developments, 
culture says it is a necessity whose value is more about how it looks rather than what it does. Tonight on How Things Work, we tell you how paint is made. First things first, paint is made with the use of four main ingredients. Resins are the film forming materials of the paint. Durability of the paint depends on the quality and the quantity of the resin used. The second ingredient is what they call a solvent. The solvent is basically a carrier in paint which aids in mixing all the ingredients together. The third ingredient is pigment. This is simply the color of paint. Additives are the last ingredients. They modify the paint to suit different coating surfaces like metal, tarmac or walls. With that out of the way, let us begin the simple yet demanding process. It all starts here. This is the factory's control room. It is here that all the paint's ingredients are accurately weighed as per the standards and transferred before the paint making process can begin. Different paint factories have diverse manufacturing setups. Duracoat, for instance, has a five floor building which takes care of the manufacturing. This plant currently produces up to 75,000 liters of paint in a day and 1.8 million liters in a month. After being dispatched from the control room, the liquid ingredients fill these different tanks on the fifth floor. When the factory is ready to start working on another batch, the ingredients vertically flow to the fourth floor. Here, the solvent is added, that is water or white spirit, depending on the paint type. The pigment, which in this case is white titanium dioxide, together with an extender which makes the paint thick, are also added. This is called the dispersion process. An hour later, the paste is ready to proceed to the third floor for blending. In these huge tanks, the resin and additives are added to complete the batch. So once it comes here in the blending tank, then the required uh, amount of additives, resin and uh, other solvents are added to finish the batch. So these are uh, the additives which are dispensed automatically as per the required weight in this one and once it is dispensed here then it is added to the blending tank. The additives depend on what the paint is for. For example, dryers accelerate the paint's drying process, deformers prevent formation of air bubbles and trapped in the coatings, anti-skinning agents prevent formation of a skin in the can. After the batch is complete, a sample is taken to the quality control for testing. Here, they evaluate properties such as degree of dispersion, viscosity, remember the physics, or consistency. Density, hiding, tint, strength, and color are also tested. So we'll make a side-by-side -side drawdown to confirm whether the opacity is matching to the standard. So this standard and batch, they are matching mm -hmm. to the jetness, like the color also we see here, and the opacity. So these are uh, zebra papers, you know. Mm -hmm. So it is hiding the black as well as the uh, white paper also to equal level. So now the opacity is okay. Once the batch is approved, it is transferred to the storage tank on the second floor. From there, it goes for feeling. It is a semi-automatic process that needs human input. The machine works out how much paint is needed in each can and therefore stops when it senses the paint has reached the optimum level. The lead presser keeps the lead of the can tightly closed. It is a job that needs attention and accurate timing. The paint is packed and taken to the storage area, then to the warehouse ready for delivery. Only 
few colors can be produced at the factory in a conventional way because of the stock holding cost and wastage. Here, they have put in place an automated computerized tinting system to overcome these limitations. For instance, if a customer chooses tango shade for the paint, the can of the base paint is put inside this automated computerized tinting machine. The color is then fed into the computer and the machine mixes the colors to attain that particular tango shade. Then the mixing begins. In less than a minute, your paint is ready. Now you know the process behind the paint on your home. Betty Kialo, how things work. That time to look at KTN Sports today. I am Nicholas Mudimba. The National Wild Youth Trials at the Nyao Stadium were made by rampant cases of aid cheating and confusion, as even the event was delayed for three hours. Out of the nine events later for Tuesday, only seven were held. Victor Gale witnessed the push and shove and brings us the details. The World Youth Trials was slated to begin at 9 a.m. Tuesday morning, but Athletics Kenya officials did not want to let anything to chance. All the invited athletes had to be vetted. It emerged during the vetting exercise that most of the athletes had presented fake birth certificates. Others had more than one, while others were using other people's birth certificates, all in the name of trying to qualify for the world event. World over, Kenya is considered as an athletics hub and, and it is for this reason that maybe these young boys and girls want to quickly venture into this highly paying sport. What set off the confusion was, for example, when athletics officials asked some athletes their names and they kept referring to the birth certificate. Some of them did not even appear yesterday for the vetting. And that means they have been changed by either certain individuals or certain people to come and run for others, which is not right. And we cannot allow this. Kulingana na file wako na birth certificate yao, tunakubali. We cannot dispute a, a, a government document. That's a government document. Kwa hivyo sasa, atuwezi kudispute kama coaches. Mini file nilitoka nyumbani, nilikuwa ready nukuja nikimbie. File mini meingia tu kiwanja, wanaansa kunetua mazema miaka ikuruzu. Youth championships are open to individuals between the ages of 16 and 17. Mwakuta mtu mungina kuna jinsa ametoa beads mapema. So kitu hizo beads unakuta wanaona kama ni mkubwa because wanafanya random li wanaangalia tu yu. They say where we yuko. Kuma watu wenye wako kwa shida. Kama watu wenye natoka turkana. Awesu kafananisha na mtu mwenye alika na irope. So hiyo ningependa nisema ya kwamba this was not fair. Meza kuta mtu alienda senior, alienda junior. In the 800 meters, Joshua Masikondi and Albana skip Ngetich qualify for the men's finals while Javinta Mawia and Jalen Chepngeno were among the finalists in the women's category. Out of the nine events slated for Tuesday, only seven were held with all the finals expected on Wednesday. Victor Ogale, KTN Sports. Too unfortunate, but from the cheaters now, Malawi national soccer team boycotted training today and threatened not to honor the World Cup qualifying match against Kenya's Arambi Stars on Wednesday over an unpayment of the allowances. But the team later resumed training and agreed to play the penultimate World Cup qualifier. Meanwhile, Hussein Terry, who is accompanying the Kenyan team, reports that the Stars are ready to extinguish the flames. The Flames are reported to have walked out of Tuesday's training session in protest of unpaid allowances. The Flames are threatened not to honor Wednesday's make or break 2014 World Cup qualifier against Kenya's Harambe Stars. According to a local daily in Blantyre, the players felt cheated after enduring endless empty promises from Football Association of Malawi. The unpaid dues dates back to the Seca for tournament where they were guests of the East and Central Africa annual competition. The stalemate was however resolved late on Tuesday and the players resumed their duties. In contrast, Kenya's Arambi Stars allowances were delivered by two senior FKF members, Robert Assembo and Hussein Terry. 
Terry told KTN over the phone that stars are charged and ready to extinguish the flames on Wednesday. Morali kujiu sana na unajua kama tuona sisi hata nyuso zao pia zimefunguka roho zaidi wanajua tumekuja kwa motivate tumekuja na kila kitu yao vijana wako sawa sana nikomba Mungu tu inshallah kesho atusaidie tupate hii ushindi. Harambe stars are bottom of the log on two points with Malawi second on six points. We are building a team ambayo waona kina Abdulatifa wale vijana wadogo ambao wako na muda wa zaidi ya miaka sita miaka minane inakuja kuweza kuchezea timu ya taifa. Namibia whose coach resigned due to insecurity at third on four points with runaway leaders the Super Eight goals on eight points with two round of matches to go to the next round. The body for KTN Sports today, I'm Hassan Juma. Right, we're almost done, but let's take a look at our big question tonight. We had asked you if you support Uhuru Kenyatta's decision to ascend to the controversial division of revenue bill. 41% of you say no, 59% of you say yes. Dickens says, I don't support it because it's a plot by the central government to maintain status quo and suppress devolution. Neon Dot says no, Senate is the custodian of development, uh, devolutions rather. So matters concerning devolution, Senate proposals must be considered. Thank you very much for being part of this broadcast. My name is Eric Njoka. Do have yourself a good night. Sleep well. Thank you for watching. I'm Linda for Bluetooth.